Watch the entire video my lovely viewers, I mean from start to finish, to get the whole thing. Without wasting much of your time, let's get right into it. Hi lovely viewers, it's me again, your one and only Mtati Mpundu. Welcome to my YouTube channel. If this is your first time on my channel, kindly subscribe to my YouTube channel by hitting the red subscribe button down below and turn the bell icon to join the notification squad. Don't forget to like, share and leave a comment. Tell me what you think about this video in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you lovely viewers. Hello wonderful people of the land, how are you? yeah i hope you are doing fine and i hope you're in high spirits i hope you're being productive and i hope you're staying safe uh i have a few things that i'd like to talk about today i know this is probably not the best uh, time to have a live video people are still working or busy with other things trying to make a living uh, trying to get through the day i get that it's not yet really night time in Zambia people are just this is when they're winding down however uh, those who have followed me for some time know that I can come anytime around the clock even in the middle of the night I do that sometimes and um, it is uh, like that because uh, sometimes it's a question of being able to make these live videos when you have a free moment and at other times it's about trying to reach people who are not reachable example during the day there might be a few reachable at midnight but at least i'm reachable to them uh, and then most of the videos are done obviously when many are reachable but there is no time when it comes to the videos on this page it can be any time it can be around the clock it just depends on what's happening now three things i want to cover right now i won't take up much of your time this is now becoming a dead issue, but I'm still going to bring it up because it's still very much part of our mindset. I'll make reference, number one, to Father Salangeti, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. But Father Salangeti is the man who sparked the controversy between government and the church, the recent debate. Uh, I'll tell you why I'm still talking about this. Number two, I'd like to talk about the gold rush in Zambia. Gold has been discovered, first in northwestern province, now in Muchinga and Mpika. So it looks like the deposits of gold in the Republic of Zambia. But it seems like people are still asleep. That's very strange. You'd think that with the discovery of gold, Zambians should be lively, livened up. But I think we have been panel beaten for poverty so much to the point where even good news doesn't sound like good news. The third thing I would like to talk about is the corruption fight. There is a fight against corruption that is taking place in Zambia. It's not perfect, but there is something going on there. Court cases are happening. People are answering to being caught in possession of what is suspected to be proceeds of a crime. Ooh, that's one of the most popular charges. However, it is a charge. And if you're caught with millions of kwacha, you should be able to explain how you're in possession of those millions of kwacha. Especially if we don't know any traceable type of professional or business or inheritance activity on your part that should warrant you to be in possession of millions of kwacha of property with millions and millions of kwacha it should match what you do it should match your job or your inheritance it should match something if it doesn't match it then there's something strange and you must at least give an explanation there has to be an explanation all right let's get started number one wafara salangata salangeta that man offended me you know that's why I haven't stopped talking about it. But when I talk about offended, offending me, I don't want to make it sound like personally. This is a national discussion, a national conversation we are having here. I'm still trying to adjust to how it is or how it can be that Muchalo Chesucha Zambia, an entire priest or father, whatever you want to call him, priest, I guess, is a priest, eh? Father Sarangeta. An entire 
priest representing a very big church dressed in uniform operating in his official capacity as a priest or a father can stand on their pulpit to an audience during official church hours and make mockery of example Zambians in Mississippi being uninterested in the lamp of Hiroshima. Now this may sound petty or trivial or not important but let me explain to you why it's important and I think when I explain you understand where I'm coming from with this. He's a priest. Okay thank you uh, Michael Chiswana for clarifying that. So uh, Father Salangate is a priest. An entire priest. Thank you Chisora. An entire priest. He's a priest of a big church. Bakatolika, they're a big church, global. In Zambia, they're big. Throughout the world, they're big. An entire priest dressed in uniform during official hours to an audience in his official capacity as a priest. Mary in a lamp of Hiroshima. I understand the point he was trying to make. I understand the point he was trying to make. It's not like I don't know what he was trying to say. I understand what he was trying to say. He was trying to say people are so poor, uneducated or illiterate in parts of Zambia, or like uh, example Mississippi. M uh, Mississippi, <laughs> not Mississippi. Mississippi is a state in the USA. Mississippi, mi <laughs> Mississippi. <laughs> compound who are only interested in the lamp of Hiroshima. Let me tell you something. Me and Father Salangate, we really can't get along because our views are different. The way we view Zambia is different. Our objectives are different. We can't get along because I was offended. I was insulted by that statement. Yes, it is true that uh, there are a lot of Zambians who are poor, that there are a lot of Zambians who are uneducated. But I can't wrap my mind around the concept of an entire priest, an authority figure, a man of influence, being able to crack jokes about our poverty situation in Zambia. But what's even worse is the audience seeing nothing wrong with it and even laughing. Now I understand it's humorous, it's funny to a certain, depending on how you look at it, I, I get that, I get that. But it's not funny. It's not funny. It's funny, but at the same time, it's not funny. It's funny in the walls of the church, maybe. But out there where people are catching fire, hunger, sickness, disease, suicidal thoughts, overwhelming thoughts and feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, no hope. It's not funny. It's not funny. We can't make light of these very difficult situations. The concern that I have in Zambia is we have normalized our own pain and suffering. We have normalized it. It's normal. That's why an entire authority figure can crack jokes about that and the audience laughing. When the audience was laughing, were they laughing at their own poverty? Or if they don't have to worry about where the next meal is going to come from, were they laughing about their neighbor's poverty? What were they laughing at? This is a church service. Bad enough we have to deal with a tough economy. But we also have to deal with issues of healing, redemption, salvation, which the church should give us comfort. You can't make jokes about a Zambian being mere interested in the lamp of Hiroshima and think it's funny. Now listen, sometimes it's not just the message, it also depends on the messenger. If such a thing is being joked by a regular person, okay fine. I know it's okay for comedians to joke about that. That's what they do. Comedians are allowed to joke of even the most difficult or serious situation 
that's their art comedy is the art of even taking serious situations grave situations and making them laughable or making fun of them to the point where the audience laughs that's understandable because that's what comedians do but an, a priest is an authority figure that is a very powerful position it's a solemn position with a solemn responsibility you don't make light of the pain and suffering of others it is inappropriate it may be legal because father salangeti enjoys his freedom of expression perhaps the church gives him the authority to say what he wants to say but is it right is it moral is it appropriate for a man in his position to be saying that me and father salangeti we can't really get along because even though we are both zambians we represent two visions of zambia he has normalized this situation i'm sure he does good works in his field as a priest i'm sure he helps a lot of people but i find it a problem that he has normalized it i haven't normalized the pain and suffering of zambians i'm actually tortured by it in fact one of the cases of being in the diaspora is it has made me a more tortured human being because how things should be and then i compare and contrast with how things are muzambia well father salangeta must watch what he says being an authority figure and an influential figure and the audience must watch at what they laugh at it's not funny it is not funny if you're at a comedy event yes we can laugh that's different but in a house of jesus christ in the body in the church where people have gone to church to listen to some message that makes sense it's not funny are those the type of jokes that we are cracking these days Maka, churches, Catholic and even these other churches is that what it has come down to now <coughs> that's most unfortunate we need to change our mindset our thinking let's not normalize poverty it's not funny we should watch the things that come out of our mouth especially when we're authority figures and when we're very influential young people coming up should not be given the impression that it's okay to laugh at our poverty situation we must be fighting to get out of it we must put up a fight to get out of poverty we can't just sit back and say you know i was talking to one of my cousins and i was asking how are you he is relatively young able-bodied but yeah i'm okay just suffering peacefully suffering peacefully i don't even know what that means what do you mean by suffering peacefully listen we are going through difficult situations we are going through poverty we constantly have to find ways of getting out of it legal ways of course um the things that come out of our mouth is important especially when we have followers you can, even even the things you tell children or you tell your child are important don't tell your child that woman want to chick up or don't make jokes out of that because that will stick it's damaging the mind frame of a zambian right now especially the next generation of zambians coming up should be that we're going to fight poverty and we're going to defeat it yes money is the root of all evil but so is poverty poverty is also the root of all evil zambians must mobilize themselves and try to get out of poverty now maybe father salangeta's view of the situation is old-fashioned it depends on his upbringing maybe we have different upbringings different experiences and of course we have different uh, visions or strategies of realizing our visions for what zambia should be but clearly there's a difference between him and i now since he's an influential person and to some extent i've got my own small little influence the best thing one day is maybe we should meet and talk about how we can better message these things to zambian people instead of just talking anyhow <laughs> and um uh, 
if we if I do, if I never get to meet my father Serengeti for whatever reason, but and someone should convey to him that he needs to change his thinking, and he should never make fun of uh, or make light of the pain and suffering of others. He, it doesn't matter whether that was his intention or not. That's not the point. I'm sure if you ask Father Sarangeta, he will say that it wasn't my intention to make fun of Zambians who are hungry. I was just making a, trying to make a point that we're not interested in graphs. It's not a question of whether his intention was bad or not. It may have been clean, but the outcome, the result is still damaging. Okay. Sometimes it may not be in your intention to kill someone. But someone is still dead. I mean, it's worse if that was your intention, of course. But it wasn't your intention, but as a result of your actions or your lack of action, someone died. That's what you call negligence, which is also an offense. And there's a penalty for that. It's not as bad as if that was your motive, but there's a penalty for negligence. If, if you, I'll give you another example. When you're drunk and you're driving, you know that your judgment is poor. You could crash and kill someone on the road or kill yourself. Obviously, that's not your intention. But because of poor judgment, you decide to drive while you're drunk. Now look, you have killed someone. So same thing. Let's watch what we say. If our father Sarangeti, maybe if I give you this example, you will relate. So imagine if Father Salangeti was a Muzungu and he said Yariamashiu. Ingi didn't move, but Father Salangeti, Gavadia, our Sungu. And as a priest, Umusungu, I am Mokolanda Mashiu, I am Sangofidia. Along the lines that I am a Zambian star for a graph of a word. Kutimu Fashad. That would be a disaster, isn't it? We can call him a racist tefu for saying such a thing because he's putting us down. Imagine But the problem Zambia these days is you don't even need Musungu Kutitefu. We put ourselves down through the utterances that come out of our mouth. The only thing that saved Father Serengeti, Temu Sungu, but he had them when I'm a bosses, Wakweva Sungu, so I never That's not his intention. That's not his intention. I'm a bosses, Wakwe, in Bitaveka and Amuzambi. They don't have to say it. They can continue pretending. They are very good at pretending. We are quite smile on if my diplomacy, if my handshake in my selfies. What if the mafia packed up and to my money at all? What will we know? They don't have to pass to do to my racist comments to our age target. We do it on our, on their behalf, and that is regrettable. That is regrettable. Umusungu doesn't have to oppress us directly. The people that we deal with can do it on, the, on their behalf. Our own people oppressing us on the behalf of the more powerful, invisible forces out there. Father Sarangeti Ngari Umusungu Tetumureke. It would have been an outcry. But him being a feral black person or a feral Zambian, to say that is what got him off the hook. But it might even be worse that if we say things that sort of psychologically keep us down, maybe it's even worse than Umusungu Kurandef. Because Umusungu Garandef, you can say, okay, not with what we need opponent to us. We will touch them and we need racist. And if we can punch. So you know what you're targeting, you know what you're fighting. But when the problem is from within, injuring each other psychologically, while the audience laughs, maybe that's even more damaging. That's what keeps us into mental slavery. That's what keeps us in a cage. 
And that's what keeps us in the bondages of poverty. So our Father Serengeti should change his thinking. And Father Serengeti should go down on his knees and confess his sins to the Lord. All right, let's move on. There's a good rush in Zambia. That's point, that point number one, I'm done. Point number two, we are hearing that gold was first. We heard that it's being discovered in Northwestern province. Now we are hearing that there's now gold in Pika. Pika is my home village. Now you can brood having you come Pika. Many relatives. My chief is Chief Chikwanda. Chironga mission to be specific. I'm proud that gold has been found there. Naipuarara. But you all know what is going to happen. Big powerful forces will come and take over. From outside, they will come and take over the mining industry. That's what they do. That's what they have always done. When they hear that there is something of value, whether it's gold, diamonds, oil, trust me, they come. They come with their smiles and their handshakes and sometimes even with their money. Um, we know how we have been treated unfairly over the copper trade, beginning even before independence. We know that two of our biggest mining companies were actually created even before independence. We know that contracts were signed even before independence. Now these multinational contracts, you can't just wake up one morning as Zambians and say we are getting out of it. That attracts disastrous consequences. So we are tied to these contracts. And we know that what we have been getting historically from our copper, which is a non-renewable resource, is just a trickle, a small percentage of what the big powerful forces have been making out there. And we have been bound to these contracts. These are not five-year, ten-year contracts. We are talking about contracts 30 years, 40 years. <laughs> Some have even born and died during the existence of these contracts. Very difficult to get out of them. Very difficult to fight the unequal, uneven global international trade structure. And the systematic racism in the international trading field, the global trade. There's, there's systemic and systematic racism in there. And what I mean by that is, what we get from our minerals is small compared to what we should be getting. And our biggest disadvantage is we don't have the capital and the resources. But this time around, and it's a shame that we are discovering these wonderful God-given assets at a time when we are wallowing or suffering in huge debt, over $15 billion. But we are finding these minerals in Zambia, and I'm sure there's even more we just haven't found out. We just don't know yet, but there's even more. And it's not like we'll find that out soon. It will take time. But the fact that we are now finding gold in Zambia means that there's a lot more than we know beneath the surface. What I can just say about this issue is, you see, you see the, the foreigners are going to come in search of these things, but I think what we just need this time around as Zambians is to have a discussion with our government about what they intend to do about these minerals that are now being found and about the contracts that are being signed. Uh, government will obviously do its job, but I think now it's time at this sensitive uh, uh, moment for people to get some interest, to be interested in what is going to happen in terms of mining deals going forward. Yes, government will sign some deals with foreign uh, investors, 
but i think now we are now at a point where as zambians we have to make it clear to the government that they have to let us know what they are signing before they sign and i think it now we are at a point where we should tell government that contracts to do with mining should include zambians in terms of ownership of these minerals zambians must be made to be owners of these minerals and mining companies and already there are some zambians who own mining companies in zambia of course but the more we are finding these minerals the more we need the government to level the playing field so that more zambians can access ownership of their own minerals and mines own shares in them government must find a way of facilitating it that's why they get paid the big bucks it's not my job it's their job to find out how exactly they can facilitate more and more zambians owning the gold which is now being discovered yes you have big mining companies like uh, fqm quantum whatever they were pumping in they said they were pumping 2.5 billion dollars i don't know if they've even pumped that yet in or kansashi mines in northwestern province and other mines in copper belt yes we get that but you see the small medium large level large scale level and extra large whatever but at some point even if it's at the bottom every zambian citizen must be made to be connected to these mines somehow whether directly or indirectly okay let me give you an example let me give some ideas because i don't like to just talk without at least offering some ideas let me give you an example the civil servants were given 20 percent partial withdrawal napsa well you can do something similar like that only this time you're not putting 20 percent in their pockets 20 percent goes directly towards buying the gold so that the civil servants own the gold from that 20 percent so the 20 percent money the cash doesn't go in their fingertips it goes towards buying the gold and the gold can be kept safely or deposited at the bank of zambia for safekeeping and the value of that gold will continue to grow for years and years and generations and generations and could be the source of generational wealth for zambians or number another option is the government could set up a parasteto to facilitate all zambian employees tax withdrawal I mean withdrawal is of a small fixed amount from their paychecks to go towards the purchasing of that gold not not tax that's tax is separate they remove tax from your paychecks that's separate but for zambians who sign up and most must be encouraged to sign up a small amount is withdrawn from their paycheck every month and taken into an account of an institution that has been set up by an act of parliament aimed at purchasing that gold on behalf of zambian employees in both the public and private sector gold will grow in value over the years over 10 20 30 years over 100 200 years so the government has a role to facilitate zambians owning their own gold just like what they did through the 20 percent napsa withdrawal just like they did with setting up napsa itself they can set up an organization if such doesn't exist already to facilitate ownership zambians owning gold or shares in mining companies that mine gold now the executive minister of mines have the authority to sign mining contracts but this time round the zambian people must tell the government that they should consult us before signing these contracts just because we need to know what it is they are signing we don't want a situation where contracts are signed then we are regretting afterwards after the fact when we can't change anything we want to know ahead of time so we ask the minister of mines 
to issue more press statements on what the government is planning on this gold that has been discovered in Northwestern province and in Muchinga province and other provinces. We also request Zambians to pay attention and to be interested in the status, in the status of our mining industry right now, our major and even small scale mines right now, to investigate and find out what exactly government intends to do with the gold that we're now discovering. We must own it. Zambians must know how it feels to hold gold in their hands. This is now the opportunity for Zambians to make money and become millionaires and thousandaires and to live a decent life. The gold, the gold. This is now a golden opportunity for Zambians to own gold. Don't mess it up. And you won't mess it up if you show interest in it. Gather as much information and knowledge about it. Share all that information. Let's share it with each other. So that we know how to engage government. And how to push government towards leveling, leveling the playing field for Zambians. So that Zambians too can own gold. On this issue of gold, I'm going to end by saying that this time round, if there are any contracts signed with foreigners to do with gold that are not fair for Zambians, that should change Zambians. That don't facilitate the participation of Zambians in the gold trade. I am appealing to Zambians to put up a resistance over this issue. I am appealing to Zambians to protest, sign petitions, and refuse to cooperate with foreign mining agencies that come here to mine our gold under terms that are exploitative if the terms are fair and just then fine but if zambians are sidelined from owning and managing to a certain extent the gold i think this time around we have to put up a resistance let's watch the minister of mines very carefully he must issue more press statements he must go and make more speeches in parliament so that we follow and understand exactly what is going on. All we know right now is that we are finding gold, but the people are still asleep, and that is so scary. The fact that Zambians are still sleeping while gold has been discovered. Look, form cooperatives, form organizations, form businesses, and jump into the gold trade. I believe the government will do what is right. As citizens, we have a responsibility to have faith in our government. But while having that faith, let's keep listening to them and following them and questioning them and reminding them that they must do right by the people this time around. Before foreigners can get their claws and their fingertips on our gold, we must make sure that we have access to it and that we are equal players in the gold trend as Zambians. Don't mess it up by falling asleep. There's gold in Zambia. The third, the third and final thing that I'd like to talk about, listen, regarding the gold, I hope I don't have to differ with the government over this issue. Okay? I hope I don't have to differ with the government over this issue. I've supported the government where they have done right. I hope this issue of the gold is not an issue where me and UPND government we go our separate ways. I mean, I'm not UPND, of course, but... 
I think I've shown support to the government in many of their programs and what they're trying to do where I think it's good. Of course, I've given criticism where I feel they're messing up, but I think I've been very supportive. But on the issue of gold, please, the Minister of Mines, don't put me in a difficult situation where we have to go, we have to now start fighting. Politically, over this issue. We are going to differ if the level playing field is not tilted or leveled in favor of Zambians. I just had to mention that because I want to make that very clear. Number three, the corruption of, uh, the, the fight against corruption in Zambia. Corruption is one of the top five reasons why Zambia remains a desperately poor country today. I'm not going to talk too much about this issue about corruption. I think I've talked about it intensively and extensively. But what I can say for now is that the Zambian people must mobilize themselves and support government in the fight against corruption. They think the, 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 the stealing is just crazy. It's nuts. It's, it's crazy. How do you find, a, how does a person like Faith Muson, the young lady, be caught with 65 million kwacha? Where did she get it from? 65 million kwacha. I mean, come on. 65 million kwacha, a young lady. Can't explain. Why are they playing with money like this? Then there are cases already in court. You hear a situation where your former, or let's say our former Minister of Foreign Affairs used some private jet to money launder uh, allegedly <laughs> four million dollars or four point twenty million dollars that's evading the banking system that's money laundering not wanting to be seen not wanting to be caught then you hear about people kidnapping their relatives because of disagreements over a lot of money all these point to theft now people do steal but come on this type of theft that's crazy. At a time when there are no medicines and machines in hospitals and people are dying young over illnesses that could be prevented, deaths that could be prevented, and then you have people who are leaders stealing so much money. Not even a Kadionko, but millions. Wow. That's crazy. That is just so crazy. Because I'm telling you, you, believe it or not, even here, in, in, in America, an American president can't be caught with 65 million kwacha. An American president. If an American president is caught with 65 million kwacha, people ask, but sir, where is this money from? The president will have to explain why he's in position of 65 million kwacha in America powerful rich country if a president is found with 65 million kwacha respectfully they'll ask sir how are you in possession of 65 million i'm not even talking about dollars i'm talking about kwacha the american people ask but mr president you've been found with 65 million kwacha what is that all about can you explain sir <laughs> they'll ask and the president must have a good explanation now, in a poor country like Zambia, a poor country like Zambia, a young lady is caught with 65 million kwacha. She's not, she's not even a president. She's not even a senior or a junior government official. She's a journalist. Caught with 65 million kwacha in a poor country where there are no medicine in the hospital. She's caught with 65 million kwacha. Where did that money come from? What if it's true? If the courts by the end of the day say, yes, $4 million was flown on a plane from Turkey to Zambia. $4 million. Mm. That's a lot of money. A lot of money. Yeesh. Leaders in Zambia play with money. They play with money. Yeah, when they're amongst poor people, they'll campaign, they'll dance 
distribute this, distribute that. But when it comes to milking their pockets and that of their families, who they are merciless. This is why I respect uh, Kaunda. Dr. Kaunda never stole from his people. Dr. Kaunda never stole from his people. I miss the old man. Yeah, he had his own weaknesses. Yeah, he wanted to stay in power forever. That was his biggest weakness. But the man never stole. He never stole from his people. And if you love your people, you're not going to steal from them. Look, if you love your... Look, if you're in a household, you've got husband, wife, children, you're not going to steal from them because you love them. You don't want them to be hurt. You want them to have what they want, what they need. You want them to be comfortable. When they are sick, you want them to be able to have medicine. When they are hungry, you want them to be able to have food. You want them to be able to have clothes. You want them to be able to go out and play with their friends, to go to school. You want your children, you want your husband, your wife to be able to, to be comfortable. Go on holidays, vacations, you know, go relaxing places. So you are not going to steal from your household, from your family. Why? Because you love them. Their happiness is your happiness. Well, the same applies with leadership. If you really love your people and you're in power to serve, not because you want to fatten your own pockets, but you want to serve the people who you claim to serve, you're not going to steal from your people. Certainly not those type of amounts. Now, you people on the ground may have memorized that situation. Me have been exposed out there. And I can tell you categorically that it's not normal for people to be messing around with those, those big amounts of money. It's not normal. That is grand theft. That is looting. They could kill you in China. Okay, so I'm not even being harsh here. All I'm saying is people should be answerable and penalized through the Zambian legal system. That's all I'm saying. But in China, they kill you. If you steal public coffers like that, they kill you. The government kills you, the state. Because I've told you that corruption leads to people dying young. It leads to people dying without proper uh, medication, equipment. It leads to people dying on the roads over accidents that can be avoided. It leads to poor conditions and qualities of service. It leads to a miserable life. It leads to hell in your own country. It leads to poverty. Corruption has killed more Africans than anything else. It's, it's, it's a slow, painful death. It's not an, a, a death where you see someone shoots someone, someone dies right there. That's not how corruption is. It sneaks in. It extends its net so wide. And people die because of corruption. Money is diverted from where it should be going into the pockets of the bourgeoisies, their cronies, their friends, their blues, some of whom they fly out of the country and they start living outside the country. So you can't even trace it. Corruption is an evil that must be dealt with decisively in Zambia. And we only have a small window right now to deal with it within the next five to 10 years. So Zambians must rally behind the Zambia Police and Corruption Commission, Drug Enforcement Commission, in the fight against corruption. Now, these institutions have a lot of weaknesses and shortcomings. That's the problem. Who has to fix it? We. We have to fix it. Let's find out what the problem is with our agencies. Because they, there are some issues in there. Sometimes they seem incompetent. Sometimes they seem not serious. Sometimes they only have teeth after the fact we have to continue finding ways and means of developing these institutions along with collaborating partners it's only us who can fix these problems but we have to fight corruption i've never seen such type of grand theft yeah i mean yeah, we are the test of it under the chiluva regime but hey this time around pf came with the avengers they were not playing. But let me tell you how it is. Uh, what happens here? Um, and then I'll close. When leaders become corrupt, sometimes they don't mean 
to make their people suffer. The problem is it does. So the fact that that's not what they mean doesn't solve the problem. They are still guilty because of their behavior. With power comes responsibility. So what happens here is this. It's very important, very, very important for the man at the top not to be corrupt. Not to be corrupt. Because what happens is if the man at the top is corrupt, even just a little bit, then the subordinates who are his ministers or her ministers say, oh, if the head of state is doing it, it means I can do it too. And then if one minister is doing it, trust me, they don't want to do it themselves. They'll do it with two or three other ministers. Then you have another clique of ministers who say, ah, look at our friends there. Okay. It seems they're doing well. Kanshina, if we let's also do this, there's this deal. Let's capitalize on that. Then before you know it, the entire cabinet is contaminated. Now, when that happens, the man at the top begins to feel uncomfortable. Because at this point now, the corruption in his cabinet, including those below his cabinet, in parastatos and to whoever appointed by his cabinet ministers, you know, corruption has crept in. The man at the top now begins to feel uncomfortable with the way corruption has now overtaken the system. The problem is, it becomes impossible for the man at the top to reverse it. That's where the problem is. It becomes very difficult, if not impossible, for the man at the top to reverse it. Here's why. Because some cabinet, some cabinet ministers have no boundaries to their corruption. Greed is blind. There is no boundary to greed. Even the richest people want to get richer. So there is no stopping them. So what happens with the president in that case is if a minister commits grand theft, the president summons the minister to state house and says, look, look at what you're doing. You're embarrassing me. I can't tolerate this. But the problem is, it's difficult to talk to the minister like that because the minister will say, ah, but Mr. President, but you're also implicated in that case. Now it becomes a problem. You can't discipline the minister because the minister knows something about you. So it becomes difficult for you to fire the minister. As a leader, yeah, you still care about your people. Yeah, you still want your presidency to be a success. Yeah, you still want to live a good legacy. But because you started it, you lost control over it. Your ministers also began doing it, and those below them began doing it. The civil service began doing it. It's now become impossible to reverse it. And you can't even dare discipline them. You fire them, they'll go to the media and spill the beans. They'll go to their constituency and spill the beans, which could be a disaster for you politically. So a president, when they become president, must make it clear from the get-go that under no circumstance will I tolerate corruption in this administration. And if you commit corruption, you are gone. Listen, listen to me very carefully. It doesn't matter how rich, intelligent, or brilliant, or friendly a president is. The moment a president loses control in that corruption fight, it's very difficult to reverse it. I know presidents make mistakes. I know presidents make mistakes. But I think what future Zambian presidents must understand is that it is very easy to lose control over it. I don't think President Chirua came into office with a plan that I'll be a corrupt leader. I don't think so. The man came into office, he was a born again Christian, and I think his intentions were good, and I think he wanted to be a great leader. And he wanted to leave behind a great legacy, hence the concept of the FTJ Institute for Democracy that he wanted to create after his presidency. But the problem is he lost control over it. He lost control over it. And the longer you're president, the deeper the problem gets. It runs out of control. It runs out of control. That's 
what Zambian presidents going forward must understand. The sooner you nip it in the bud, the better off you'll be. If you let it go and you fail to discipline your ministers, it's just a matter of time you to get out of hand. Greed has no boundaries, has no limit. It's blind. You'll be surprised. You can say, how did such an intelligent minister become such a thief? How did such an educated minister become such a thief? How? You even say, this minister was comfortable before he became minister. How did he become such a thief? Let me tell you what happens. Corruption, it, it sneaks in like osmosis. It's, it's, it's contagious. It's like a coronavirus within a cabinet and parastatos and the civil service. The moment someone in there knows your secret and has your file, you're compromised. You're compromised. You're compromised. It's, it's, it's like, uh, what example can I give? You're a boss in a company or whatever, or in politics, whatever. And then you start sleeping with your, I don't know, secretary or fellow minister or the lady that cleans the floor. Well, she knows your secrets, doesn't she? She knows that you two are having an affair. You're sleeping with each other. So, she can do whatever she wants. Even if she doesn't want, feel like working, she'll say, ah, today I don't feel like working, I want to work. What are you going to do? <laughs> There's a deadline. You tell her, hey, Susie, come on, we have to do this deadline. No, hey, Susie, come on, you have to do ABCD. Well, you're sleeping with each other, right? She can come to work and say, I don't feel like, well, I'm not coming to work today. Oh, well, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> now, the problem here is this. You can decide to fire her, but be ready that should you pull that trigger, she can go and spill the beans and say, ah, no, this guy is, uh, you know, we've been sleeping with each other and whatever and things like that. And then it becomes a public scandal. I'm just, I just picked up a random example. And so that it doesn't look like I'm picking on women, it can go the other way around. It can be a woman minister, start sleeping with a driver. <laughs> I'm just giving you an example for the lack of a better, you know, I had to find an example. They know their secret. They know what they have been doing. They know that if one pulls the trigger, the other one, if they're injured, might open their big mouth and spill the beans. Remember that minister of education who exposed his uh, uh, dick on WhatsApp to some married woman? Well, remember that? <laughs> Remember, that was under the PF. I mean, I'm sorry to bring this up, but I'm trying to stress a point here. The guy was careless. How do you show your penis on social media, right? Well, she recorded it. And then, what followed? Suddenly, buy me this, buy me that, buy me this, buy me that. The moment the relationship went south, what happened? They circulated this video. Exposed his private parts for everybody to see. And the president fired him. It was President Lungu at that time. Fired him. It was embarrassing. Seeing a minister of education exposing himself like that. So if you expose your manhood or your woman would on social media someone gets wind of it trust me the next day they'll come to you and say hey give me five thousand kwacha and i promise we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day you give them they use up that five thousand kwacha they come back next month ah, someone yeah there's inflation and that five thousand i used it up i give me another one <laughs> 
You give them another one and say, okay, this is the last one because I can't manage. I can't keep giving you my 5,000 or my 10, my 10,000. This is it. Let's, let's just end it here. I'm going to give it to you. Leave me alone after that. So you give them 5,000. They use it up. And then they still come back and they say, hey, yeah, life, you have Give me some more money. Go to your phone. Buy me a house. Build a house for my mother-in-law. And then you say, are you a singer? What is it? That's what I put And then the person will say, are you a? Is that what I I have your private parts on my phone. Is that what I put That's what you call blackmail. You are being blackmailed. And if you don't, they will expose, they will circulate. Nobody will know who took it out there in the open. Everybody will look at your private parts. And if you're a minister, you might lose your job. Same thing with corruption. If any of your juniors know that you made money on that deal there, they know your secret. This is where people can become wicked. Because Apa, when someone is blackmailing you, you can become wicked. Because you know that I'm finished, I'm gone. That's why once in a while, in the past, you've heard stories of, unfortunately, political assassinations. What drives the person to, to such wickedness? Well, if a person knows something very dangerous about you, unfortunately, you can resort to those underhand methods because Uziva to Jamunta Kaurula was I in the Gujere. Or you lose your job, or you lose your marriage, or you lose all your money, or you lose everything. So you know that Ujamunta Kaurula and they have evidence against me, that person is dangerous. That's what drives people in a position to commit political assassination to do that. And it's terrible. So the best thing to do is, in the first place, it's better to just avoid such criminal mentalities from the beginning. When you are elected a leader, from the beginning you just make it clear that no nonsense are If you as a leader haven't stolen, or haven't done anything wrong, and your ministers do it, it becomes easy to fire them. Because you summon them and you say, hey, I see you store there. I'm firing you. Get lost. You can fire them because you know that there's nothing that that minister can say about you that is dead. You haven't done anything wrong. But my point is, if you yourself are dead, it becomes difficult. So... That's the lesson in leadership. And it's not just in government. These are lessons that are applicable across the board. It can be uh, whether a headmaster or a senior official in a school or a hospital or uh, a government office or even in the private sector. Conduct yourself properly because if you don't and somebody in there knows your debt, they'll keep playing with you left, right and center and you'll be helpless and powerless and you become a victim. So, Zambians should rally against corruption. I mean, they can't be stealing all that money while people are suffering. It doesn't make sense. People should be held accountable. Let me remind people, huh? especially those who are in PF, if they did steal, if they stole, of course the, the courts are the ones who prove that. Just because you are from Bemba or from Chipata or Eastern Province, that doesn't mean I'll support you. I have nothing to do with that. So what? You are Bemba, so what? You are from Eastern Province, so what? I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what province you are from. I don't care what region, what tribe you are from. Tribe is useless to me. Region, what region someone comes from is useless to me. If someone comes to me and says, ah, I'm your fellow Bemba, so what? Is that irrelevant to me? And by the way, when you stole, did I even benefit from your theft? Not that I wanted to benefit, and thank God I didn't benefit. I'm happy that I had nothing to do with it. Thank God. Because I don't want my name dragged in the mud. Never. Never. I never want my, mud, my name to be tarnished. But you're Bemba. Okay, you're Bemba. Should I support you just because you're Bemba? Should I support you just because you're from Eastern Excuse me, that has nothing to do with me. When you store, you store on your own accord. 
Okay? It was your own pocket you were feeding. That has nothing to do with me. So don't expect me to be sympathetic to you just because we come from the same region. That I don't care. I don't care. If you're a thief, you're a thief. Whether you're from Northern or Eastern or Mjinga, it doesn't matter. Whether you're from Southern, Western, Northern, it doesn't matter. A thief is a thief. Okay? A thief is a thief. That's why I, I, I can't believe that there are Zambians who will defend a thief just because they come from the same tribe. That's nonsense. And then you'll find the defenders themselves are living in poverty themselves. If they get sick or their family gets sick, they're just as vulnerable as everybody else. Nah, nah, that's nonsense. So my appeal to Zambians is rally behind the fight against corruption. Let's destroy this uh, wicked uh, orientation and system that has made us poor as a country so that we move forward. Yeah. So anyway, I've touched on everything I wanted to touch on today. Thank you for staying and watching. Thank you for listening. I hope this was of value to some of you. I hope you learned, or to most of you, if not all of you, and I hope you learned something from it. And like you learned from me, I also learned from you because I do read your comments. I Sometimes I respond to them as much as I can, but even if I don't respond, rest assured, I do. I read them. I read your comments and I learn from them as well because it's what you call feedback. I'm feeding you information. You're also feeding me. Most of the things I know, by the way, is not from school. When we're talking about Zambia, huh? it's not from school. The best knowledge has come from interacting with you, the people, for years, for years. You can't learn these things from school. No. <laughs> but you can learn them from social media. It just depends on how you use it. It just depends on how you use it. Thank you. You have a good night and stay blessed. I'll see you tomorrow or at the end of the week, which will be a Friday. God bless. This is DJ Mutati exclusive. All right, that's all right for you today, lovely viewers. If you did enjoy the video, please don't forget to leave a comment in the comment section below. Tell me what you think about the video you just watched in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you, lovely viewers. Once again, I go by the name of Mutati Mpondum. I love you, peace. I gotta go.